Great. Oh, am I lunching? Lunching. Oh, I like how my beef is right here. Do you want this there or do you want it in the picture? <laughs> is it better to have it not in the picture? It's up to you. Yes, yeah, I Also, hi, I'm Miss Shane. Shane? Yes. Okay. So, this is the mic? Uh, yeah, just put it anywhere you feel. Put this in your pocket. And the receiving end is going to go into the laptop. Okay. Um, is it on? Did I turn it on? Yep, it's on. <laughs> Hello, this is Savannah. Does that work? Everything I'm gonna do this. Where's my backpack? Okay, charge this. Shane, can you reach? Wait, Shane or Shay? Shane. Shane, can you reach the plug for this? Is there another plug over there? Yes. Even today? Yes. So this will be my last time seeing you. Yes. Thank you. Right. Right. So how is that helping? I mean, not what what how are you getting feedback? Are you getting feedback from Oh, okay. See, okay, let me get these waters from out from here. I'm trying to get y'all set up so it looks pretty. Oh, we should put something African here. Oh, where's the Oh, it's big right here. It might be too big. No, that's too big too. It's distract. No, it's too high. It's too high. It's too high. I'm sure. But something a little MS, like a little. This is, uh, if you're going to keep doing it here, I think printing something this size would be fresh. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. <gasps> Look at those earrings. Those are so nice. She made them. You're fucking kidding me. That's the guy you had of life. What? What? Those earrings. Those are amazing. You made those like with your hands? That's amazing. See, I think that's the joy of living like in a town where you're not always commuting and hustling and scraping and scraping to survive. Almost. Gassy, gassy. Okay, you're not, I don't have to be ready because you're ready. I'm about to. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't have to be ready to go go. You going to go go? I don't have my clicker yet. I have my backpack, which is somewhere. Okay. So you go ahead and start. I can I can do the clicker. Quick as easy. All right, so y'all can keep getting your lunch. I'm just going to do an intro. We're also live streaming and recording um, this talk. Um, I am so happy to be here today. Welcome to the first Electric Maru Nash Tayyid. We um, are so happy to have Savannah Shange here. I'm going to talk a little bit about Electric Maru Nash and do an intro um, uh, for Savannah. Um, Electric Maru Nash is a collaborative digital media project based uh, and also a material project based on principles of fugitivity, black femme freedom, worlds otherwise, and colonizing diasporas. It's curated by myself, Yomaira Figueroa, along with Jessica Marie Johnson at Johns Hopkins University. 
Uh, we're going to be having a series of events this semester um, in relation to Electric Maronage. Our website is electricmaronage.xyz or electricmaronage.com. The events are here on this poster um, board. In addition to having um, the speaker uh, here, we also had a workshop yesterday with the grad students around um, publication and autoethnography. We'll also record a podcast that's going to be on the site. And um, each of the visitors is going to be curating part of the website um, based on one of the rules um, that we created for Electric Maronage. We'll bring the book up into the symposium, and we're so thankful for um, the generous um, support from the positive parts of letters. Our dean is here, Dean Jeff Long. Hey. Hello. Okay, we can this lunch. So, <laughs> um, so today we are joined by our first Electric Maronage Taller leader. Dr. Savannah Shangay, who is a Black queer feminist scholar, and she works at the intersections of race, place, sexuality, and the state. She is an assistant professor of anthropology at UC Santa Cruz, and her research interests include gentrification, multiracial coalition, ethnographic studies, um, Black femme gender and abolition. She earned her PhD in Africana Studies and Education from the University of Pennsylvania, a MAT from Tufts University, and a BFA from Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. She has been awarded a Hellman Junior Faculty Fellowship, a Ford Foundation Fellowship, a Jack Kent Cook Foundation Fellowship, and she was also a Point Scholar. Her first book, Progressive Dystopia, who got it, someone raise it up in the sky. And oh, what's, over here. Wait, is there, what's, I know we do we need raffle tickets? tickets? <laughs> yeah, yeah, hold on. <laughs> Progressive Dystopia, uh, Abolition, Anti-Blackness, and Schooling in San Francisco is an ethnography of the afterlife of slavery as lived in the Bay Area. Previously, her research has been published in Women in Performance, The Black Scholar, Transforming Anthropology, and The Feminist Wire. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Savannah Shange. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for that and very generous introduction. And to you, of course, Jamada and Jessica. Is Jessica here? Uh, yes, yeah, she's on. on the Jessica? Way. Yes. Thank you so much to both of you for holding this space, creating this space of autonomy and freedom within institutions that are not always as welcoming to be here. Thank you, Dina, for being here. Um, Dean Long for being here. Um, and it means a lot to have the kind of institutional support that you have to do this because it is rare. It is rare and it's very precious. And I hope everybody in this room really recognizes that and fills it with as much possibility and builds on it to make other talleres, other workshops, um, for other on other um, kind of gestures towards freedom and possibility build out of this space. I also want to give thanks to Jada, Catlin, Dana, and Aya for their work in coordinating logistics and getting us here today. Um, I really appreciate that because I know there's the intellectual piece, but the intellectual piece can only happen with a lot of incredible competence and labor and real um, care for the details. So I appreciate um, everyone who made that possible. So today I really want to think about abolition and what it demands of us as scholars and as people. Um, and so to that end, I'd like to share with you an image that really grounds my book and part of the, and, and a few parts of the introduction in order to frame how abolitionist method is working in my work and what it might offer to yours, what we might be able to build together. And then I wanna move from there into a story about what it means to grow up black and girl in the city of San Francisco. Does that work? Okay, say a word. So, hello, do you know me? Have you seen me? What is my name? Oh, he's not talking to me. Okay, let's see. Okay. Nope, that didn't work. What are we going to do this again? Oh, you know why? Because it was at the end. That's why. That's all why. Um, I was really trying to do something with my life. Let me see. No, it's also dead. Okay, here we go. Our Lives Matter. In the fall of 2014, the website of the Robeson Justice Academy prominently featured this image of 200 or so mostly brown hands raised in the air, some resolute, some reluctant. The young people were crowded onto a crumbling blacktop basketball court holding signs that read, hands up, don't shoot, and murder is illegal, arrest the officer. The whole school photo shoot was organized by youth leaders with the consent of school staff after the grand jury in Ferguson, Missouri refused to charge a police officer, Darren Wilson, for the murder of black teenager, Michael Brown. The image is a reflection of this small public high school's mission to offer culturally responsive social justice themed education to low income of color, right? 
The walls are emblazoned with graffiti murals that read equity and decolonize, and both Audre Lorde and Frantz Fanon are taught as part of the core curriculum. Nestled in the hills of one of the last working class neighborhoods in San Francisco, Robeson Justice Academy is a product of a hard fought multiracial campaign led by Black, Latinx, Polynesian, and Asian American students and parents and educators to open a community based high school and thus represents the fruits of collective multiracial progressive struggle. This photo's presence as the outsized header on the Robeson website that year, overlaid with the caption, Our Lives Matter indexes a critical or even combative relationship between this institution and the carceral state of which it is a part. However, despite this public stance of opposition to racial bias, the year this photo was taken, this school, Robeson Justice Academy, had the district's highest suspension rate for black students, as well as far higher rates of disciplinary referrals and expulsions. So how do we reconcile Robeson's exceptionally punitive disciplinary practices with its institutional narratives of itself as social justice and liberation themed as exceptional, right? What does a place like Robeson, roundly regarded as a win for progressive left reformers, tell us about who loses when we win? How is the hour of our lives matter raced, gendered, classed? Who is disposable in a progressive dystopia, a real life city of mirrors where diversity is king, settlers keep settling and slavery never stops? By, by replacing Black Lives Matter with Our Lives Matter, the high school's discourse uneasily skirts the tension that erupted, you know, y'all remember this, this co-optation of the hashtag around, hashtag brown lives matter, or hashtag Muslim lives matter, right? When our lives matter, and multiracial Robeson, blackness is eclipsed by the more equivocal people of color. The dissonance between what initially, initially feels like such a liberatory coalitional move, right? Is sharpened by the signs in the front row held by a series of Latina girls reading, my generation is next, don't shoot. The performance of racial analogy is both cathartic and politically strategic. A young Latino man, Alex Nieto, died in the street after he was gunned down by the police department that was supposed to protect him just weeks before this picture was taken. In part, these young women's plea represents the blackening of Polynesian and Latinx bodies in a white and Chinese city and the brutality of dispossession as dis is distributed across these different axes of racialization. But this mode of racial solidarity cannibalizes black suffering in order to state that their generation is next, non-Black people of color had to set Black death in stasis, already a fact, a cautionary tale that might save them from being the next state execution. So this book that I'm sharing parts of, Progressive Dystopia, attends to these tensions between coalition, anti-Blackness, and the state by documenting the afterlives of slavery as lived on one street corner in San Francisco. The argument of the book turns on this generative antagonism between our and black in the mattering of lives. By examining a series of progressive reforms and what they cost black communities, I critique winning as the dominant logic of social justice work. I ask who loses when we win, not so much to expand the we to an ever more inclusive list of deserving subjects, but to ask what becomes impossible when we only engage in contest as the mode of black politics. This is the differential between revolution and abolition. Revolution seeks to win control of the state and its resources, while abolition wants to quit playing and raise the stadium of settler slavery society for good. Reconstruction too is a cue of abolition. I'm thinking both in the Du Boisian sense, right? And in more contemporary versions of this. It assumes that this state is both inevitable and recuperable and that we must ensure that the lofty rhetoric of citizenship is equitably applied to all across uh, lines of racial and ethnic difference. That's why MSU exists. That's why the University of California, Santa Cruz, where I live exists, right? These are state institutions that are literally meant to distribute the resources gathered from the tax base and distribute them to, to every high school senior who graduates and shows that they want to be part of this, that they want to make it. So we're in a redistributive structure right now. But from the perspective of abolition, it is the universalizing rhetoric of the liberal state that is the problem to begin with. By splashing this Our Lives Matter photo on their website, Robeson makes what Fred Moten calls a claim on blackness, as does the broader multiracial progressive movement that enlists, enlists blackness as a central conceit of people of color politics. But when Our Lives Matter, it is only in their ourness that black folks' lives matter because they, we, are one of us. And yet we'll see as this talk goes on that being hurt, being mistrustful, being unapologetically black can get both students and teachers expelled from us because they no longer deserve to be in this special place or be a citizen of this ad hoc polity. 
Robeson Justice Academy is a small, resistant, progressive, and yet eminently civil society. One, the meniscus of which is kept taut by the internalized policing required under the regime of carceral progressivism and is punctuated by the spectacle of black expulsion from its exceptional space. The lethal distance between our and black is instructive, particularly at this moment when democratic socialism has re-entered mainstream political discourse with Bernie Sanders' second presidential bid picking up steam and the heralding of a Green New Deal. That's reconstructionist point blank, right? From bumper stickers in the school parking lot to zealous Facebook posts, Robeson and staff members were vocal about their support of the Sanders candidacy in 2016. I was one of them. And though Sanders lost, black people and people of color were the presumed beneficiaries of a democratic socialist pres presidency. The presumption fails because black, black flesh is always in excess, uncivil, marked by its incongruity to the progressive project to which we remain narratively central and yet materially surplus. Progressivism is fundamentally a reconstructionist politic embedded within liberal logics, right? It aims to hold the state accountable to its promise of democracy and justice. And while the protagonist of progressivism's political narrative has expanded from the white working class to include the black underclass, the undocumented black the brown migrant, its story is fundamentally a state romance. Social justice means living happily ever after with the anti-racist redistributive state. Abolition is a messy breakup with the, with the state. Rending, not reparation. Okay, so but what does this mean methodologically? What is the how of abolition, particularly for us in the university? For me, abolitionist anthropology is one of many possible names we could come up with for apprehending the necessary conjuncture of anti-Blackness theory and a critical study of the state. Antecedent to its location as a specific disciplinary mode, abolitionist anthropology is a genre of black study. For Fred Moten and Stefano Harney, study is what you do with other people. It's talking and walking around with other people, working, dancing, suffering, some irreducible convergence of all three held under the name of speculative practice. The point of calling it study is to mark that the incessant and irreversible intellectuality of these activities is already present. It's not just when we show up as scholars that all of a sudden something is happening, right? It was there already and we're lucky enough to be able to glimpse it, right? Be part of it. The speculative practice as of study as sketched here is immediately recognizable to any ethnographer. Is there anybody who works in ethnography or does kind of work in communities that way? Okay, okay, shout out, hello. Um, for anthropologists in the Americas, uh, so we call this fieldwork, right? We immediately recognize this, like this is fieldwork. And for anthropologists in the Americas, that fieldwork is never completely out of sight of another set of fields. Sugar, cane, tobacco, rice, our real time is stitched together from what Catherine McKittrick calls plantation futures, a variegated time space called forth from the hold of the slave ship, the social life that animates the socially dead. This mode of heterotemporal study then also invokes the speculative practice of black science fiction writers like Octavia Butler, N.K. Jemison, Nayla Hopkinson, whose willingness to dream other worlds inspires my rendering of this one. So those speculative fiction is central to Afrofuturist practices, right? In their capacity to creatively envision black utopias, I tie it here to dystopia and death. Rather than an opposition, the utopic dystopic impulse is actually one symbiotic di dyad. It's only distinguished by emphasis, by emphasis, where utopia claps on the one and the three, dystopia claps on the two and the four. Just as dystopias are, are utopias and these pedagogical tools that educate our desires and aspirations towards an ideal world, dystopia in practice also provides an education of perception, one that attunes us to death, dispossession, disposability as codices to interpret reality. So crucially, this focus on social material death is not just hateration for its own sake, but it's in a, instead it's my attempt to challenge life as the only possible site of political valorization. If, as Jared Sexton suggests, a politics of abolition could never finally be a politics of resurgence, recovery, or recuperation. It could only ever begin with degeneration, decline, dissolution. Then dystopian narratives are key to constructing just such a politics. Abolition starts at the end of the world. And Black folks in San Francisco have a lot to teach us about how to survive an apocalypse. So Christina Sharp offers us this. 
if the question for theory is how to live in the wake of slavery, in slavery's afterlives, the afterlife of property, how, in short, to inhabit and rupture this episteme with their, with our knowable lives, an abolitionist anthropology finds its answers in the register of the quotidian in the cruddy, ordinary facts of blackness. So I don't seek to make black lives knowable, as Sharp suggests, given the tendency towards hubris that can swell in my discipline. Um, progressive dystopia offers a few glimpses of black area, Bay Area blackness. I would say black area bayness, which is an interesting remix there. Um, a Bay Area blackness as it inhabits and ruptures this episteme of late liberalism. Significant here is this dyadic relationship between inhabiting, living, and rupturing, destruction. This syncopation or two-step between the present durative sense of black sur survivance and the future perfect of abolition. Progressive dystopia is an attempt to engage anthropology as a practice of abolition and an ethnography of the afterlife of slavery as lived in the sucker free city. Speaking of which, is San Francisco in the building? Is California here? Anybody from California? Oh, okay, okay. Y'all from Southern, <laughs> Southern California, Northern California? SoCal, SoCal, down south, oh. up north, like up, up, like Klamath County, north, Humboldt. Okay, 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 I see you. Okay, <laughs> South Bay, come through. Oakland, South Bay, okay, okay. Um, 408, yes, yes, and? Okay, okay, so SoCal, strong, <laughs> South Bay, also in the building. So abolition here is not a synonym for resistance. It encompasses the ways in which black people and our accomplices work within, against, and beyond the state in the service of collective liberation. As an analytic, abolition demands specificity, right? It's 408, it ain't 415. The very kinds of granularity that ethnography offers as an accounting of the daily practices that facilitate black material and symbolic death. Abolitionist anthropology then is fundamentally a black feminist method. It's an ethic and a scholarly mode that attends to the interface between the multi-sided anti-black state and those who seek to survive it. In the process of unthinking the state, abolitionist anthropology joins at least two generations of attempts to reconceive a disciplinary project built on colonialism, collusion, anti-blackness, and extractivism. Emerging from deep relationality with ancestors and contemporaries, its practice is a mode of reparative caring that seeks to be unaccountable to what is unaccounted for in social reform schemes. So I didn't write this book to be like a manual for how to be like a better, more radical, more activist scholar. I only offer it as a provocation, as a set of questions about whether we can care more than we know and extend our analyses past the ruins of the world and our disciplines as we know them. So here's story time. Ordinary demar departures, bodies and border management at Opison. The toes of Sierra's kitty-sized, white-on-white Nike Air Force One squeaked as she dragged them across the speckled linoleum floor. Go ahead, said Jeff. We ain't got all day. Craning her neck in order to make sure he could see her rolling her eyes at all six-plus feet of him, she exaggeratedly picked up her feet and speed-scooted towards the principal's office. Jeff, the security advisor on duty, looked over at me on my perch at a student desk in the hall and broke into a wide grin. He shook his head and tried to suppress his laughter at Sierra's comedic timing. The school building that housed Robeson Justice Academy was plagued by the same faulty infrastructure and lax upkeep that impacted the rest of the San Francisco Unified School District. Half the classrooms at Robeson had radiators that never turned off, even on the sunniest of days, while the rest of the rooms were jerry-rigged with heaters that teachers had to bring from home because the radiators never turned off. My room was one of the former, assigned to me for the two classes I taught as part of my combined volunteer role of instructor and researcher for that school year. My hallway perch was a perk for an ethnographer. I had a plastic chair with a flip down desktop. Y'all remember those flip flip and you had to drag them around, right? They make that like squeak, screeching noise, screeching noise. So I had it stationed outside the classroom door for myself or a sweaty student to escape whenever the room got too hot. There as I graded papers or fitted, fiddled with field notes, I got to see the parade of smaller and larger beings rounding the corner near my room as they made their way along the square path created by the small school's four hallways. Sierra seemed to come by at least once a day during her freshman year, usually on her own, but sometimes escorted by Jeff, the brawny school security guard who had spent most of the last 10 years as a bouncer at gay clubs. His round cocoa face sparkled with the steel hoops in each eyebrow, septum and even a labret piercing poked through his beard. The imposing, don't even think about stepping to me air to his self-presentation was scented with 
a queer impishness exemplified by his nickname, Sweetie Pie. Also the moniker of a weekly party that he continues to host at local bear bar <laughs> is popping. Jeff's official title as student advisor was creatively designed by the school leadership at, the, at this place so that Robeson could avoid hiring a, a security guard from the district pool of union security guards. So rather than like kind of an anti-union measure, uh, they did this because the SFUSD guards were notorious for corruption and incompetence. And it committed acts of sexual harassment and fomented conflict among students when they were in place in the first two years of the school's existence. So Jeff's position had more hours per week than a typical district guard, was better paid, and more significant in terms of institutional governance. Because he had a new restorative justice-based job description that allowed them to do site-based hiring rather than being shuttled through the central office like special education and counseling positions are. And I bring this up, do I have educators in the building? Yes, school folks, because we often don't talk about the institutional ways that autonomy is created, right? We, we inherit a set of ways that we come into a school building and whether you're a teacher, an administrator, a school counselor, a librarian, being ex understanding how you get these other little tributaries of power and resources to flow to you. It's the same kind of tributaries that allow us to be in a room like this, right? And allow a taller like this to exist. They're happening at every level of public education. The shift from guard to advisor also points to the institutional exceptionality of Robeson Justice Academy. Located um, in, this, in this working class neighborhood, one of the few left, Robeson was founded by this group of different folks who came together to organize for college prep to be offered to this neighborhood. Because before that, all of the, the, the schools in that neighborhood didn't even offer the requisite courses to apply to the four-year university system, right? Students would have had to go to community college first. So this public in-district high school was designated by the district as a small school by design and was a, a granted a measure of autonomy that we usually only associate with charter schools. Budget, schedule, curriculum, personnel decisions were all made at the school level. And Robeson's investment in democratic governance that meant that often all 30 or so of the staff members tussled through consensus-based decision-making on topics ranging from the start time of the school day to whether a do-rag counts as a hat. Robeson's staff was less than half white with the, with the balance reflecting the diversity of Northern California, people of color, right? So Latinx, Filipina, Indonesian, Guatemalteco, a couple of black folks spiced in for good measure, mostly concentrated in lower paid, non-teaching support staff positions like Jeff's. Even with his fancy title, his piercings, his blackness, his queerness, and his dessert themed nickname, there were still times that Jeff served the same function of school security across the United States removing mostly black children from classrooms and delivering them to their administrative fate. He, like every other staff member at Robeson, and like most folks in this room, are caught in a late liberal double bind. We work for institutions that we know are soaked in bias and inequity, even as those same institutions have more or less commitments to ending bias and inequity. Robeson's status as an institution with an exceptionally robust commitment to social justice doesn't map predictably onto the disciplinary practices. The year that Sierra enrolled, they had that high rate of suspensions, the highest rate of suspensions for black students in the city. And instead of indicting individual actors for the crimes of structural racism, I wanna engage Jeff, Sierra, and the other folks in the school building as a way to trace the flows of race, place, and power in the context of gentrifying San Francisco. Black girl ordinary, an exception to exceptionality. Sierra never stops moving and aspires to dance in music videos like Sierra, the multi-platinum R&B star whose name she invokes every time a new teacher hesitates when they see her name on the attendance roll. The first time she was in my theater class, she jumped out of her seat to do a quick eight count footwork and gyration combination announcing, duh, it's pronounced Sierra. <laughs> Sierra's projection of self is quotidian in its mass market ubiquity and yet dissonant from the self stylings of most, Rob most Robeson's black staff who come through dripping in black alterity, right? In contrast, Sierra's instantiates what we might think of as black girl ordinary, a genre of what Lauren Ballant calls crisis ordinary, which posits that the ordinary as an impasse shaped by crisis in which people find themselves developing skills for adjusting to newly proliferating pressures to scramble for modes of living on, right? It's the, or, it's the crisis that is the structure of our lives. Within San Francisco, those pressures to scramble on include housing precarity, massage noir, police terror, slave violence, and the grinding disorientation of having been a slave. Ordinary in this sense is marked by the temporal, an impasse, a lacuna in the ongoingness of linear time. 
So in this frame, black girl ordinary is that which signifies on, but does not conform to normative notions of gender through a performative blackness as shaped by hip hop, social media, and conspicuous consumption. It is a mode of what Jose Munoz would call queered disidentification. However, for those of us who are black girls, who have been black girls and who love black girls, know that there's nothing unremarkable about Sierra the student, Sierra the pop star, or any other black woman child refusing to be disappeared at the margin of common sense. Even ordinary black girls is allergic to ordinary. Sierra's constant stamp, uh, stomping, dancing, and booty popping in hallways and classrooms invokes Amy Cox's notion of social choreography as a descriptor of black girls' creative and strategic engagements with the state. Black or ordinary inverts the logic of the talented tenth. We don't need no lifting, climbing, or saving. Instead, it improvises on social and aesthetic choreographies to disrupt the inherited rhythms of captivity, progressive or otherwise. Regular, degular, schmegular black girls stay dancing in the face of state-sanctioned slow death. Ours is flesh made fierce. You might also know Black Girl Ordinary by her government name, Black Girl Magic. A circulated, selfied, carefree mode of Black femininity, Black Girl Magic has been both celebrated for its affirmation of Black women's thrival, despite the adversities of racial capitalism, and critiqued for its association with a light and curly stratum of bourgeois Negroes. Black Girl Ordinary and Black Girl Magic are coterminous, of course. I use the former to center a materialist reading of gendered black self-making and refuse the misogynoir that might seek to elide what is common to black girls in order to elevate that which is seen as exceptional. We're conjurers all with magical is that we're still here. Further, black girl ordinary can serve as a counterweight to what we might imagine as black boy special, a category of reverence and urgency that has coalesced around a century of hand wringing over the fate of black men. At Robeson, those hands are wrung to the tempo of respectability-driven anxiety about the incarceration of hyper-incarceration of black men and boys. They wipe away tears shed in staff meeting over having so few black boys in a certain graduating class. For instance, only four young black men crossed the stage at both the 2013 and 2014 commencements. This is at a school of 300 people, right? And a whopping seven out of the 56 graduates of 2015 were black boys. Both non-black and black staff participated in the institutional focus on black boys. And some black staff saw working with black men and boys as central to their teaching identity. For instance, in a focus group I convened for black robots and staff, Nyla, a fair-skinned English teacher who had been in her position for nine years, recounted going to the mat when her students were threatened by their fellow advisors with not being able to participate in the graduation ceremony. This is not for academic reasons. This is as a disciplinary. Something happened like at a field trip. So as the consequence, to make sure they knew what they had done was wrong, they were threatened with not being able to cross the stage. She said, quote, they were saying two of my black male advisors couldn't walk on stage. She ended up walking out of that meeting because, quote, at some point, I'm going to have a personal beef with you and it's not going to be professional. Maurice, a young black retention counselor and a Frisco native in his early 20s agreed. I feel that the graduation means so much for an African-American male. It's like being drafted to, to the league or something. While both Nyla and Maurice lift up their very real concerns about black boys, a closer look at achievement data from those same set of years reveals that black girls didn't fare much better. In the 2013, 2014 graduations with four black boys crossing the stage, a whopping five black girls graduated each year. In 2015, when seven black boys graduated, only four black girls crossed the stage. Zara, the college counselor, explained this laissez-faire treatment of black girls' educational outcomes. Quote, because there's this bleeding thing of like black boys are not being educated and you know all these terrible things. They're gonna get caught up in the streets and all these different things. When a black boy is completely off the Richter, but then shows some kind of promise or progress, people are just so ready to grab him and coddle him in such a frustrating way. And I think for black girls, I don't think there's that much space. There is a fear associated with angry black women, like angry black young girls. And I feel that folks don't necessarily know how to deal with that. <coughs> When folks don't know how to deal with black girl anger, their default response in the school context is often to displace children from the classroom. Hence the meandering trip Sierra and Jeff took through the hall to open this talk. At Robeson, belonging was policed in the register of affect. Does she really wanna be here? He doesn't seem like he's taking this seriously. I, I don't believe that apology for a second. Affective performance shapes belonging in and to a state funded space. Significantly, these phrases are also common at zero tolerance charter schools, right? The political nemeses of Robeson, which, but in, and this is not Kip, right? 
This is a school that went through a series of battles with both the unions and within their own ranks to not become a charter. But yet both these types of institutions function within the same libidinal economy that is repulsed by unruly blackness. You can tell a Sunnydale girl. One of the teachers most likely to send kids down the hall with Jeff was a science teacher, Kate, who took pride in her reputation as a hard ass. Kate's carceral logic was on display at a faculty meeting where the school leader asked the 11th and 12th grade team to help shape the school-wide goal, goal, goals for the following year. Because as she said, a lot of times we're jumping to the solution and we're not even sure what problem we are fixing, right? So this is a good kind of leadership that we wanna see. Tina guides the team through a process of identifying bright spots and obstacles in relation to reaching Robeson's mission of community independent thinkers and social justice. We've been in these kind of meetings, right? Strategic planning. When it came time for Kate to read her bulleted post-it note of obstacles and stick it on the whiteboard, she rattled off, quote, kids struggling to take responsibility for learning, kids being disrespectful to teachers and peers, a core group of kids don't seem to adhere to our values like repeat offenders, kids being truant, kid teachers seem to believe in our mission more than our kids do. So my eyebrows were not the only ones to perk up at Kate's penal system reference with repeat offenders. Several other staff members piped in um, in response to say that the obstacles were on both sides of students and teachers and things like lack of diverse student leadership and systemic oppression might also be making it hard to achieve the school's mission. Right? So in this sense, I'm not bringing up Kate as a representative of the general tone of the Robeson staff. She met with a lot of pushback. However, in the context of a consensus-based decision-making, her perspectives got a lot of airtime. And combined with her standing as one of the strongest content instructors in terms of the way her science classroom produced outcomes, it made her formidable for even those who disagreed with her. And at the same time, it's also important to think about these folks as people, it took a long time and a lot of energy of other people at the school to kind of manage her particular political ways, right? Think about how do we amass and like apportion those resources. But anyway, Kate minced few words and fashioned herself as both valiantly committed to racial justice and taking no shit. I caught up with her with an for an interview for this book after she left Robeson. When we met, I shared with her some of my findings from a descriptive analysis of the disciplinary data and asked her to reflect on the demographic bias of policing within the school. In particular, I had looked at school level referrals, right? Which is that's kind of what happens when a student is sent to the office by a staff member. It's in-house data that's collected for advisors and it reveals the kind of the micro patterns of exclusion and policing. These are documents that never make it to the district level because it's not officially a suspension or officially a, an expulsion. So people often think, oh, it doesn't really count. When you actually start looking at that, at these non-events that don't count, they actually structure the borders of belonging at Robeson. It teaches us that we have to be able to collect that data, not just in a big data set that you get off you know, the internet, but actually be in schools and see what's happening. Almost half of the Robinson students got at least one referral during the 2012, 2013 school year. So it happens a lot. It's not a big deal on some level. However, most, a lot of people got one, but black students made up 77% of those who got five or more referrals, right? This highly policed group, even though they're only, they were less than a quarter of the school's population. Further, although discussions about school discipline are often framed in the targeting of black boys, the student with the most referrals that year was Azizi, a black girl sophomore. She had been sent to the office 23 times in her sophomore year, mostly for being out of class when she wasn't supposed to or for being disrespectful, never for fighting, for theft, or anything else that might warrant Kate's repeat offender label. Um, is it helpful to go more into the gender stuff, or y'all? Yeah, okay, people, in, okay, okay. Uh, who are you, what's your name? Dahlia Fernandez. Dahlia or Delia? Dahlia. Dahlia? Dahlia's ready. Okay, so for Dahlia, this is where we're going. Black boys and girls had almost the same likelihood of being asked to leave class, right? This equity stands in stark, stark contrast to how gender usually plays out in school disciplinary patterns. So for instance, for Latinx kids, and this is a school that's majority Latinx, so right? This is important to think about this space. There's barely one white student per class. We often think about blackness in relation to whiteness. The really important thing about studying San Francisco and why I value this particular school as a place to think about so much, it allows us to think about anti-blackness outside the context of white supremacy. Of course, it's always happening. It's in the water. It's in, you know, it's everywhere. And this is a majority Latinx school, right? Um, and so that shifts what we understand to be the norm Right? How do we understand multiraciality and how these things play out between us? So for Latinx students in this school, 
um, it was a more conventional disciplinary pattern. Latino boys were twice as likely to be highly policed in the highly policed group than Latina students, reflecting this kind of more traditional pattern of school discipline in which female gender functions as a protective factor against suspension and expulsion. And this is kind of goes to what Hortense Spiller teaches us about the ways in which black women's gender functions is not the same, right? It's actually not the same gender as other people who have gender marked as women, right? So I recounted this gist of disciplinary de demographics to Kate. Looking at the spreadsheet, she denied that there was a pattern of bias in referrals and argued that instead, Robeson was far too lax with students. She brought up Tarika, a black sophomore as a prime example. I think Tarika's story was largely written before she walked into Robeson, right? I think the kids from Sunnydale are really, really interesting to me because you can almost always tell they're from Sunnydale. It's just this little part of the city. How can you tell? What is it that makes you feel like you can tell a sunny, Sunnydale girl, I ask? A Sunnydale kid. You can definitely tell a Sunnydale girl. The boys are a bit tougher to figure out. I think it's two things. I think it's skill level, which is really interesting to me. I don't know how that transfers through neighborhoods, but really the kind of thing where you just, what happened before now that you, that there would have been some intervention that would have whatever, really, really alarming skills. And also, I don't know a word other than hurt. These Sunnydale girls are just really, really mistrustful of the world, really, really mad, really, really defensive, really unconcerned with, really unconcerned with how other people think about them. That, that's all already gone when they get to us. Like when I would be having trouble with a student in class, I would ask other teachers for advice and somebody would eventually say, oh, they're from Sunnydale. And that would be an, ex an explanation for like, there's nothing really that we're going to be able to do. Sunnydale. Nicknamed the Swamp, is the city's largest housing, public housing project with just under 800 units held together by duct tape and desperation from exposed wiring and toxic mold to lack of access to fresh food and competent health services to its complete erasure from any mainstream image of San Francisco, Sunnydale is the portrait of urban disinvestment. Like the other four remaining severely distressed subsidized housing projects left in the city, the swamp is undergoing demolition right now, today, as we speak. Destined to go the way of the towers and the VGs, places that used to be home and are now just an excuse to fight, to get ink, to defend your right to be from some place, even in a city that has no place for you at all. Project residents are disproportionately women and overwhelmingly black and Polynesian in the context of San Francisco's blacklist diversity. In Kate's rendition, the swamp is less a political economic force than an ontological one. Tarika and her ilk are somehow of the landscape. They become these Sunnydale girls. Blackness gets recast as indigeneity in the second order settler colonial landscape that has already been, as far as Kate can imagine, exhausted of native bodies. Of course, that's not true, right? In this sense, Kate, since Kate's deployment of Sunnydale girl is shadowed by narratives of the vanishing Indian turned disappearing Negress. By 2021, the swamp will be eroded completely by neoliberal urban expansionism. Kate's, Kate's ethnological move to categorize Tarika as sunny daily as feminine, right, while doused in the ruse of black girl knowability, points to this contested relationship between blackness and land in the Americas, and to what Kip Tiffany King calls the black female body as a process that is constituted by and constitutes landscapes. Perhaps this is why she finds it harder to tell Sunnydale boys, right? Place is etched more deeply into the flesh marked as female, even when displacement is the constitutive characteristic of blackness in the first place. While Kate names poor academic preparation as a primary marker of what makes a Sunnydale girl, the ethnographic record contradicts her. Even though she can tell that Tarika's low skill story has already been written, she had never actually taught Tarika or seen her in a classroom setting. If Kate had actually spent time in Tarika's classes like I had, she would have seen her begrudging attentiveness in US history, heard the hesitant curve of her tongue around Spanish vowel drills, and bore witness to her bored irritation after finishing the do now equation before the rest of her classmates in geometry. Unlike most of her peers at Robeson, Tarika passed the math portion of the high stakes standardized California high school exit exam, or the Casey, on her very first try. But Kate wouldn't know that because she never had her in her science class. All of her encounters with Tarika were disciplinary and they mostly happened in the hallways. Kate's leap in logic reveals the ways that black girl affect can be made to stand in for both structural location and the capacity for agency. If Tarika acts defensive, it must be because she's from the projects and can't do school. Her story was over before it began. 
Kate bemoans Tariqa's gender deviance from affective norms. You can tell a Sunnydale girl because she's distrustful, angry, and hurt. But rather than engage 20 generations of good reason for her not to trust the state and its agents, however benevolent, Kate is distraught that, quote, there's nothing really that she is going to be able to do. Perhaps then it's Kate's own incompetence and impotence in the face of Black sass and anti-Black racism that marks Tariqa most deeply as a Sunnydale girl. So ultimately, it's Tariqa's anger that justifies her expulsion from the category human for Kate. She reasons, in the hallway, she will go from nothing to very, very, very mad. And maybe Tariq is going to be fine. Maybe she's fine. It's hard for me to imagine her in the world. It's hard for me to imagine her in a retail job or however people transition from youth to adulthood. And I think that's really scary. That's how the cycle continues, right? If Tarika has a baby and she brings up the baby the same way, right? I can't stand the cyclical nature of the whole thing. And I, I feel like Tarika is not going to help break the cycle. I feel like this one deserves tea. <laughs> she can't imagine her in the world because in part for Kate, Sunnydale is not in the world. The community center, the library, both corner stores, the families, the homies, none of this counts as life for her because the swamp is a space of social death, excised from the territory of the human. Sunnydale as a spatialization of social death counters the claim that the black is nowhere to be found without spatial coordinates, Instead, we might imagine a map of blackness unfolding from within the flesh of Les Damnés with, the, with black girl, girlhood as this cartographic impossibility that sutures life to death, then to now, settlement to plantation. When, Karik, Tariq, when Kate encounters Tarika in the hall, she fails to see the possibility of her future, transition from youth to adulthood, right? Or her escape from the muddy terrain of the swamp in the world or even an encounter between her and a proper human being interacting with outsiders. In her flesh, Kate sees an unmistakably gendered void, an invagination that is non sequitur to the loops of time, space, and the social. Kate can't fathom a future for Tarika, and yet she fantasizes about her as a black hole, ruminating on her reproduction, her impending failure as a black parent responsible for her community's downfall, echoing decades of professional anxiety about the black culture of poverty. Which is also always important to note the culture of poverty is actually first theorized about Puerto Rican communities, right? And understanding those kind of connections between blackness, brownness, and different modes of Latinidad that are seen as either preparing for citizenship or preparing, preparing for blackness. Kate's foreclosure of black futurity also anticipates the, the demolition of the swamp and pulls discussions of time into those of space. Note here that Tariq is unthinkable as an adult, even as like somebody who takes your money at Old Navy, right? But crystal clear as a bad mother. College graduate, spiritual leader, mathematician, sitting president, mentor, urban sociologist, MSU professor, community activist, none of these paths show up on Kate's map of the swamp. Instead, she recycles antebellum notions of black people as perpetual children and breeders, and recalls Amy Cox's prescient warning that, quote, our failures to articulate and witness black life and in particular black girlhood as a dynamic creative space continually being remade in the future tense has grave consequences. These consequences are doled out every day in the name of breaking the cycle at Robus and Justice Academy and at urban schools and nonprofits across the US. But what if as an alien outside the circuits of settler sense we had imagined the unseeability of Tariqa's blackness, the impossibility of her futurity, the black holes that preoccupy Kate as the very center of a knot tying together the world as we know it. This is the Afro-realist imperative. Developed by Joy James as a rejoinder to the masculinism of some Afro-pessimist scholarship and to the foundational racism of democracy, Afro-realism centers on what James calls the black matrix which is both a material and signified maternal black body. The black matrix is where anti-blackness is yoked to anti-feminism and where the disembarkation provides an embodied departure point for marinage. Afro-realism recovers black girl flesh from its disposability at the margins of settler democracy and places it, her, me, at the center of freedom's landscape. What happens if we do the same in the social fields of a high school? remapping its topography with Tarika, Sierra, and their homegirls as the compass point. 
James goes on to observe, Western democracies manufacture the black matrix as disposable through libidinal, linguistic, and material economies. In his commitment to a progressive reinvigoration of democracy through consensus-based decision-making and racial equity, Robeson Justice Academy also, at times, reinforces the boundaries of democracy by excluding those who challenge its terms. Ironically, Tariq is made disposable at Robeson through the discourse of equity and inclusion, right? She's one of a flank of black girls in her incoming class, including Azizi and Sierra, who are pushed off the Robeson student roles between their sophomore and senior years. Kate's long jag on poverty pathology was actually part of her argument that more kids need to be kicked out of Robeson in the service of social justice, right? So let's get into how that happens. When I asked her who she might be thinking of, she identified, quote, that little crew of tiny black girls. You know who I'm talking about. Like Sierra, Jackie, that group, that group of tiny ones. Like Tarika, I can't believe she's still there. At the time of our interview, Tarika was a junior at Robeson and Kate had moved back to the Midwest for graduate school. She reflected, quote, if I can't really be a social justice educator because I just have a couple of kids who are being cray cray, then how are we any different? And I want the kids to know that they're in a special place and I want them to treat them, treat it like in a special place. Tarika and them were being cray cray and instead of demonstrating what, what Saidia Hartman calls the proper spirit and bent backs of deserving Negroes. These tiny black girls had the nerve to stand up straight and Kate thinks they've got to go because otherwise she won't get to live her dream of really being a social justice educator. Here, Robeson's exceptionality, how are we any different? Requires the punition of unruly blackness. In this case, a coerced transfer of Sierra, Jackie, and Tarika into other district schools. Of the three young women Kate names in this invective, only Tarika lives in Sunnydale. While Sierra traveled over an hour to get to school from a predominantly Chinese middle-class neighborhood on the other side of town. And Jackie lived in Oakland, using an aunt's address to stay in uh, San Francisco schools. However, the objection Kate identifies with Sunnydale seeps beyond the few square blocks of the housing project to ensnare all of these black girls in a wide swath of urban topography. Sunnydale has been made to stand in for a certain mode of black girl affect that can't be implotted in her special place. But the joke's on Kate. Instead of her boastful prowess of being able to tell a Sunnydale girl, housing project geography is revealed as yet another alibi for anti-blackness. In Kate's lament, we see echoes of the reconstruction era, white, white abolitionism as well, you know? Because America is a special place and you need to treat it that way now that you're free and all, right? This is the basis of some abolitionist support of black codes. But instead of rescuing black folks from the ravages of the plantation, and delivering them to participate obediently and deferently in the free market, right, as, as the bulk of mainstream abolitionists were doing in the late 19th century, by creating this special social justice high school, the educators at Robeson have rescued Tarika and her peers from the dysfunction of a kind of militarized, miseducating, comprehensive public schools and given them this incredible place to learn. And they were learning. Kate was a deeply competent classroom teacher, as were most of the Robeson faculty, right? This is a place where in the state of California, we don't, we don't fund schools the way they do in Michigan. Only 26% of high school graduates in the state of California are even eligible to apply to four-year college, right? That's across all races. Yet at this school, there was a 60 to 70% acceptance rate for students to get into four-year college. So they're really transforming the material conditions of education. It's important to see this is a win. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Right, literally it provides a national model. People fly in to come visit this school. And so at the same time, we have to see what are the other dynamics that are happening even in this space. We're doing the very best we can. What's the distance between the best we can do and what needs to be done, right? Not to mention the fact that Kate is now um, an expert on educational policy, but I digress. The opacity of the flesh, a methodological coda. You can follow me, but I'm not gonna talk to you. That's what Tarika told me when I asked her if I could shadow her classes. My first impulse was to cajole her with jokes and build rapport. I mean, surely she would talk to me eventually. Or else I could just default to any of the other dozen or so black girls who, with whom I had an easy bond, whose text messages bottlenecked on the screen of my phone, whose mama's voices I could tell by heart on the phone. And in, but I bit my tongue. And in the interest of taking young people at their word, I assented and silently sat beside her, not only through the beginning Spanish class that I spent every, uh, every morning in, but also shuffling on through the halls to algebra, humanities, advisory period. Even now, I know Robeson staff who have Tarika's current number and I have her Instagram handle 
I heard from somebody around the way that she did end up graduating from another SFUSD school. So I could ring her up with a few questions about that experience. Um, I could slide in her DMs or try to take her to in and out for a follow-up interview, but I won't. Built into the genre of ethnography is an expectation of narrative richness, a rich tapestry of voices that leaves the reader satiated by the elegant rhythm of I saw, she said, I saw, she said. The right way for me to end this talk is with like a pithy quote from Tarika an emic insight that can stand in for 20 some pages of academic grandstanding and give me credit as a community-based eth accountable ethnographer who gives my research participants the last word. But for me to reach out to Tarika with the intent of hearing her perspective, even in the interest of this putatively liberatory project, if this is electric marinage, we gotta hear what she wants to say now, right? That still demands access to black girl interiority as the price to ride on the freedom train. If both the carceral and the decolonial engagement with young black women rely on the same remedy, her transformative, tra her performative transparency, right? Then both political projects prioritize their own frameworks over black girl self-determination. And this might be where I fail as an anthropologist and the petticoat of my disciplinary drag might be peeking out. But I sense that there might be more explanatory power in Tarika's agentic absence than in the opacity of not knowing then I would find tracking her down like a runaway and feigning a complete circle of analysis. Tarika don't want me to find her. We were never close. And while she assented to participate in the study, she also drew clear lines around her involvement, just like she did with her high school. Tarika's counter-institutional, and in this case, counter-disciplinary negotiations signify on the politics of belonging by remaking the rules of participation. In her math class, I watched her obstinately roll her eyes and refuse to speak when called on. And even though she had completed all of the algebraic equations com correctly, along with the extra credit problem, she rolled her R's with the best of them in Spanish class before she escaped into the hallway for half an hour of respite from the tick and the talk of the justice-themed school day. She refused the weight of what Hartman calls burdened in individuality and thus was refused citizenship in Robeson's tiny progressive polity. So instead, I try to write in collusion with Tarika's ethnographic refusal following her no without trying to transform it into a yes. Her manifestation as a black matrix straight out of Sunnydale brings us back to the utility of indigenous political theory in the city, where Frisco indigeneity is a new foil for those old dispossessed twins, the Ohlone and the Negro. Audra Simpson articulates an indigenous politics of her refusal in her engagement with her own Kawanaka Ronon communities facing ongoing settler colonialism. In lieu of Du Boisian, Orphanonian or later Glenn Cotardian double consciousness, Simpson theorizes proliferating consciousnesses that refuse the recognition of an external gaze, producing endless play along the lines of, I am me, I am what you think I am, and you're, I am who this person to the right of me thinks I am, and you're all full of shit, and maybe I will tell you to your face. Understanding slavery as structure rather than an event, I borrowed Simpson's conscience, the caution that, quote, to think and write about sovereignty is to think very seriously about needs, and that basically it involves an ethnographic calculus of what you need to know and what I refuse to write. I refuse to write light into dark, to coerce quiet from noise or wipe color onto a canvas that's soaked in black. Methodologically, I'm trying to compute the value of self-possession in the context of dispossession and figure a way to get Sierra and Tarika back into the equation. The reclamation of black girl sovereignty in the ethnographic test may only be possible through what John Jackson calls a thin description a sort of non-knowing that disentangles the ethnograph ethnographer's will to know everything from an interconnected will to disclose everything. Opaque on purpose, Tarika's practice of black girlhood is an epistemic refusal as well as an ethnographic one. She doesn't concede to the terms by which we seek to know her. Hers is a fu familiar fugitivity, one that social science can perhaps track but never apprehend. So what does it mean for us to contour our methods such that refusal is part of the shape rather than an aberration? Silence, refusal, absence. The missing black girls of the humanities archive challenge the dominance of the order of vision in, this, in the human sciences and force us to contend with opacity as a site of knowledge production. The epistemology conjured by black girl ordinary refuses empirical elaboration. You can follow me, but I'm not gonna talk to you. Generative and nuanced, Tarika's refusal is also a mode of dark surveillance, right? What Simone Brown talks about as it charts possibilities and coordinates of responding to, challenging, and confronting a surveillance that's almost all-encompassing. 
in both the hallways and in the pages of my nascent book manuscript. She watched me watch her. Black girl opacity demanding to be seen, but refusing to be seen through. I know that was long. I feel like I should, it was, it was, there was a lot going on. So if you want me to go back to parts or like follow up questions about this, or I also love to hear about your own work. You know what I mean? This doesn't have to be the time where you're like, just a question. If you want to share part of what you've done in practice in classrooms or in terms of how you're thinking about your own projects, that would be great to hear too. How many pre You got this. <laughs> mhm. Mm um, and so it's something that for me, I mean, we love black girl magic, right? We are black girl magic, of course, of course, of course. And it's just like people are like, you know, black women are gonna save the Democratic Party. Why we gotta be magic? Why can't we just wake up and go to work, take a nap, right? And so I think part of it is in our celebration and effusion, right? There also can be, and this is also partly the way that social media works, right? An emphasis on that which is enjoyable, which is very close to that which is consumable, right? So as opposed to only the contoured face or only the most joyful day. Black girl magic is also falling down into a pool of tears. Black girl magic is making it through a fucking four hour wait at the welfare office, right? Black girl magic is sitting outside that principal's office until she comes out and talks to you in your face, right? But we think of black girl magic as something that's often divorced from the everyday labor of reproducing black families, protecting black children. Black girl magic is sitting on a bus to go to a prison that's three and a half hours away every week, you know what I'm saying? To go visit someone and make sure that they have contact with their community, right? To bring your children to see their father, their grandfather, their uncle, their cousin, their brother, right? And so I think for me, Black Girl Ordinary is about really seeing the ways that people live Black girlhood and Black womanhood is all magical, right? And I think particularly for those of us who are in the academy at any level, right? Whether undergrads, grad students, like how many of us are here alone? in the sense that the people we grew up with, the people who made it possible for us to be here aren't here, right? And we can, that can mean that we're seen as exceptional, right? I'm the only PhD in my family, but it took every single member of my family for me to get that PhD. And so it inverts that logic of instead of us being seen as the chosen or the exceptional or the best ones, which we know is not true, it pushes against us even having to be seen that way, even as we strategically obviously have to flip and use exceptionalism in order to get these grants and do this and do that and do this. But um, I really wanted to value black girlhood unmodified, uh, unhyphenated, right? And this also turns into thinking about how do, for me as a black American who is trained really in a Caribbean notion of Africana studies, which is to be, a, say, a global notion of Africana studies, right? So I was trained by Caribbeanists in a way that I felt like is really important to understand archipelagos both there and in the Pacific to be the centers of how power flows in the world for sure. And also for me as someone without a flag, right? With a Navy blue passport um, to the extent that I even have one, right? How do we understand black Americanness as neither unexceptional and also not uninteresting or less than or just black, right? And so I think for me, black or ordinary is also a mode of valuing and loving and finding sacred um, black Americanness without the language of exception. Hi, Trinity. <laughs> Trinity is a fantastic undergrad here at MSU that I had the luck to be able to speak with yesterday. Trinity, do you have any thoughts? I want to, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Ashe, Ashe, thank you so much for being here. I just want to bring you in because I think, especially when we get 
you know, we do talks and this and that, and we pitch them to the grad students or like the administrators and this and that, but really the lifeblood of institutions, both in terms of literally how the doors stay open <laughs> and the mission is the undergraduate education. So I just wanna really value you for taking this time, right? You're on your way from work, you gotta do a million things. It means a lot to me that you chose to come into this room. Um, and I really appreciate you being here. Do you mind you putting your call on people? Yeah, so you want to come over here? I got okay. I just, I <laughs> I know that you've spoken a little bit about this at, at your um, at an earlier event, but could you say some a little bit more about ancestors mm -hmm. and how you're thinking about um, the relationship of ancestors to uh, the the black girls who, who, who you, you're, you're encountering and who you've encountered? And can I just interject really quick and say mm -hmm. um, that the very first line of the book is uh, writing is ancestor work. So. So I think there's a, a, a few things. Since I was just talking about um, undergraduate um, education, I think for me, writing is ancestor work because teaching and learning, like all of teaching and learning is also ancestor work. And this is something that literally just the other day, I had to give my ancestor speech to my class and literally call in like, for, for here, does anybody know their great grandmother's name? Raise your hand. Does anybody know their great, great grandmother's name? Does anybody know the name of a great, great, great grandmother? Okay, where's my great greats? It was you and great, great grandma. What's your great, great grandma's name? Mm -hmm. Antoinette? And you know one too, Tamara? Okay, Hester. Mm -hmm. And so I bring them into this room because without, first of all, it is such a blessing that you know Antoinette, that you know Hester, that you know their names. It is so incredible and so rare. And also, for all of the of those of us who don't know our great great grandmother's names to be present with the systems and structures that made it so we don't know their names, right? What facilitates that forgetting? Because that's the same thing that facilitates us forgetting that we're not here alone. We're only here because of those great great grandmothers. And I say great great grandmothers in particular because of the gendered labor of allowing the next generation to go forth, the gendered reproductive labor, right? And so when I say writing is ancestor work, I mean to say that I want to write so that I do not forget, right? And literally can remember, reconnect myself to all those who made it possible for me to do the work that I do and for all of us to do. We're never interacting one-on-one, -on -one, right? We're not interacting, oh, I was in a meeting with Bob. You were not in a meeting with Bob. You meet with Bob's mom, Bob's wife for sure, with Bob's kids, with Bob's animal, right? And that kind of interconnectedness, I think is one that does not stop with death. Um, and so I often think about like, can I make this, it, can I, how can I altar build? Often, you know, we, people build lots of different kinds of altars. Of course, there's like formal spiritual al um, altars, all that is where, you know, you have items and you put them on top of your dresser, right? There's also the altar you make out of this day. Can this day be an offering to those who made you impossible for you to live this way, right? And for those of us who are in different kinds of leadership positions, when you're thinking about which ancestors, both in my own lineage and those who I am lucky enough to be in encounter with, Right, so I'm teaching. I have a class right now with 125 students called West Side Stories. It's almost exclusively I teach at a university that's mostly students uh, born and raised in California. And so, really thinking about what are all the lineages that come into that room, and how can I teach in a way that both honors and offers transformation to all of those lineages, right? And so, I think that's for me part of understanding writing as ancestor work. Um, and then, in particular. Um, Wait, were you asking about with girlhood? Somebody said about girlhood and ancestors? So I think the other piece around that is that when we think of both carcerality and um, early death at the hands of the state or the hands of street violence. And so over the course of this book, over the course of working at this school and then, and then writing this, I lost three students, like personal students who I had worked with to street violence, right? in addition to the other students who were shot in the leg and walk with a cane, shot in the eye and blinded on one side, like students who had been maimed by, um, by gunshots, right? And these were all uh, male students. And those who visited them in the hospital who bring flowers to their still existing murals on the street, right? Who carry their memories, right? Who change their passwords, their IG handles to RIP, right? Who every year without fail on the birthday flood us with pictures and memories, right? Who put the like, uh, the, the Gothic font on top of the photo and post it against the sky, right? They are girls and women and mamas, right? And so I think the way that we understand ancestor work is both 
to hold space for those who have passed, right? For Kenan, for Waga, for Josh, for G1, and for all of those who do the labor to support their memories. And I want to join in that labor and have the work that I do. You know, I didn't write, if I was not an academic, would I have wrote this book? No, I wrote this book to get tenure. That's why I write books. You know what I'm saying? That's a material reality. Like I, my child needs health insurance and I want a job where I can show up in her classroom during the school day, right? And be part of her education. That is why I came into the academy. While I'm here, right? I wanna do work that doesn't waste the time of anyone that I'm interacting with and that honors the kind of labor that's already happening. And just because it's in a book is still the same black mama work, it's still the same black auntie work, right? Just in a different register and in a way that um, allows me to keep a foot in multiple worlds in the sense of like realms, not disciplines or like jobs, you know what I mean? So in light of what you're just saying, how do you connect? I'm, I'm interested in the idea of ancestral fugitivity, mm -hmm. right, and, and what we were, we're getting into um, as a mode of resistance to and, and where are we getting these, you know, these practices of fugitivity mm -hmm. right, from? Uh, in terms of ancestral fugitivity or futurity or both? Both. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so... So I'm gonna say a couple things about this and everybody's not gonna be excited about what I'm about to say. I'll tell you right now, unpopular opinion. Um, for those of us, so for everyone who was black in the Americas, in all of the diasporas, whenever they got here, including those who have no lived experience of chattel slavery, they continue to be ensnared by the system of anti-blackness as structured by slavery. So it's important for like all the diasporas, including contemporary African folks who came post 1965, like, you know, I'm teaching my class and like, did we come from Kings and Queens? He's like, I did, I don't know about y'all. <laughs> Literally, I had a student, I had to really go into it. Like, oh, right, 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 right. We have a different material relationship to blackness and chattel slavery, right? So I think that's important to understand that it's not just the experience, the historical, right? The genealogical, but the symbolic, the political, right? Um, when Amadou Diallo was shot down in New York City, right? He the descendants of slaves, right? He have he didn't have a U.S. passport and was shot and killed for being black in all the registers. And I think I bring that in because sometimes we can get again exceptional about the U.S. There's a lot of people on the internet who think that being an American descendant of a slave is something somehow discernible, separatable from all the other places in the Americas where blackness was produced and repatterned through. So some people often ask me, "Oh, you speak Spanish? Are you Latina? Like, are you Caribbean? Are you this and that?" I'm mean, and just like all so most of us, except for. Hester and Antoinette's great, great, great grandchildren. I don't know. I'm actually deprived of the knowledge because how long does a ship have to stop for me to count as Haitian, right? Is one generation in Puerto Rico enough to count as Puerto Rican? You know what I'm saying? Like how, how does that happen? So I think when we think of ancestors, it's not just genealogical, but also um, that like a vertical time because I think, and this is what Held Hortez Village really helps me see is that vertical time has been stolen from us, right? Horizontal, horizontality, both in terms of space and time is another way of creating ancestors um, in terms of those. So also my ancestors are also those, are also Josh, G1, uh, Waga, Theo, right? These are also students who are now in the ancestral realm. Um, and so there's that. The other piece is, you know, there's a lot of folks who I think in very powerful ways are really hailed by um, the folks who jumped off the slave ship, right? Those who committed suicide, infanticide, as part of the slave, um, as part of the process of enslavement and those who refuse the middle passage, right? We are not descended from them by definition. Right, those whose bones are at the bottom of the Atlantic, although they are in our ancestors in some ways, to claim them and hop over those who were too physically restrained, too sick, too scared, too proud, too faithful to commit suicide, I think is really important that we are descended. I am descended from those who stayed on the ship by force or by choice or by whatever lands in between those when you're just trying to stay alive, right? So I think Fugitivity in that sense, we can often think of, oh, the, fug the fugitivity of refusing, 
you know, that's grand marinage. That's the grandest marinage you're going to get, right? That is not a door that, while it's like affectively open, I also want to really hold that the fugitivity that I hold in my veins is that of surviving this and expanding it and expanding it and expanding it. Maybe that's how it breaks, right? And so I think that kind of ancestral fugitivity is also one that we can offer balms, we can offer healing, we can offer salves to the youth and to those who have passed behind. So I think the kind of transformative work that we do can be offered to those who have already passed and so. Sorry, I kind of took a turn there, took a turn there, my bad. <laughs> Sure. Um, I was wondering if you were going to say anything more about this statement because abolition demands that we're So, in, in two ways, I was thinking about kind of making an argument for ethnography as a part of how we think about abolition and anti blackness. Um, and so, a lot of anti black theory in these streets um, is done by folks who work on literature or um, at the film. Um, people do like film studies and, and media studies and lit and kind of folks who deal with, not even, not even like historians, like people who deal in the realm of circulated ideas and narratives, right? Part of the, I was trying to do with this project is what happens when we take that theory and actually bring it up against the way people, like actual people who live in everyday life. Right. And so for me, that shift um, around abolition is like, yes, there is, of course, the desire and the theory and we want it. But how, though? Right. And not just how. How is it also not a new idea that you just came up with in your Ph.D. program? Right. Like, how do you understand, uh, for instance, California residents, you may be familiar with this turn of phrase, fuck the police. Right. It is a California original. It is a multiracial proverb of abolition. And I think when we understand that abolition isn't something that like kind of comes up from on high, but is actually a reflection of mul multiple generations of ongoing resistance to the state and refusal of the state's legitimacy, um, I think for me that's important. So that when I talk about specificity, I'm thinking about the granularity of ethnography, of actually being with people, not just for an interview. I mean, that's cool too, that's great, but actually being there day in, day out. What are the exact policies that are, okay, wait, there's a gang injunction in San Francisco. Who's on the gang injunction, right? The gang injunction in San Francisco had black, Chicano, Central American, Polynesian um, folks listed on it, right? There actually is a, a whole Chinese American and Vietnamese like, uh, street economy going, they weren't on the gang injunction, right? But the gang injunction provided a material site of resistance, not only for all these different racialized communities, but also for people who were in ongoing fatal street um, uh, feuds to actually come together to resist the state, right? And to literally, to march together as, you know, people in their the, the uniforms of, of street excellence and come to city hall and come to the police department and be like this is a, a race this is a racist structure right and so I think that kind of specificity is not just like oh we should multiracial coalition is not you know not uh, uh, attainable or not feasible because it's anti black like, okay and <laughs> what are the ways that people are doing this work anyway and so that's the kind of specificity I, specificity I was thinking of when you're actually getting with communities and being in community yourself right and seeing how that happens. Um, and I think the other piece is, um, yes, yeah, so that's one thing. The other piece I think, you know, a lot of folks are very familiar with prison abolition, or you should be if you're not, right? And we also think of, often think about abolition as being um, the freeing of all political prisoners, and then eventually, you know, then all nonviolent prisoners, and then in some, you know, universe, the freeing of all people from punishment and being in cages, right? But if we understand those cages to be literally directly connected with this university, I don't know about here, but in many states, uh, like you know, this, the universities are required to build, to buy furniture that's built by slave labor inside of uh, correctional institutions, right? If you see those institutions as co-imbricated, you can't abolish the prison by itself because it only exists by itself. So you have to have that specificity of analysis that really understands the prison to be the symptom of or the tentacle of one larger um, democratic the democratic vision of kind of like the liberal state. And so 
which might be like, okay, well, I'm not that abolitionist and that's gravy, but it's understanding what your relationship to that larger system is. I have a question from the Facebook Live. <gasps> Hi, Facebook okay. Live. Yes. How y'all doing? Um, and it's a question made as a comment, but you can answer it. Okay, let's do it. Let's go. Come on, comment. On how teachers or late liberals can't imagine Tarika as an adult, mm -hmm. but can imagine her as a, quote, black, bad black mother. Mm -hmm. And the distance <clears throat> between those views and the social justice work was so important. Thank mm -hmm. you for making that mm -hmm. legible. Mm -hmm. You want to mm -hmm. say a little bit more about that? I'm so glad that it. Facebook. I'm so glad that I'm so glad that that resonated. I mean, in some ways, I'm actually not so glad because I wish that this was an exceptional story. I wish that it was rare that this happened. And I feel like part of what we need is more structural attention to the need, not just the needs of, but the political visions of and the brilliance of black women and girls. And so one of the things that happened after I left the school site. So after I completed my, so I worked there for six or seven years, left, went to grad school, came back, did field work, then left again. So after I left again, I still stayed in contact with folks who were um, in the school. And one of the school leaders who had called in the book, Tina, Chinese American woman, who had a really very strategic and nuanced set of kind of her own racialization practices in the city of San Francisco, uh, Chinese American women are the norm for school leadership. Like most principals are Chinese American women. San Francisco is a Chinese city, right? It is, it's not even, it's not an Asian city. I mean, it, there are a lot of Asian folks. But it is a Chinese American city. It's the highest proportion of Asian American residents of any major city outside of Honolulu, right? And in the school district, the school district is 47% Chinese American. That's in addition to other Asian communities that come through, but for really multiple generations, Chinese American folks have really crafted San Francisco as a site of like real power building, right? And reflections of the needs of their communities. One of the things that Tina struggled with is with black parents who had always had Chinese American teacher, Chinese American principals, and had always been at loggerheads with them, how to separate herself from just being one more Chinese American woman trying to tell your kid what she's doing wrong, right? So the way that she dressed, she always wore t-shirts and jeans with a blazer on top. She always had the lit manicure with the tiki tackies. You know, she did all these things to really try to position herself and her self-styling self as not necessarily more black, but less a certain version of Chinese American middle-class aspirational respectability, right? And so I bring her up because after I left the school, she had started, and partly after conversing about what was coming out of the work and this and that, she had started um, a leadership program that wasn't to build black girls into leaders, but she actually basically created an advisory board of black girls to help her be a better leader, right? And so she had, literally, she would go to them and meet regularly. And the way she talked about it, this is after I left the school so I didn't get a chance to observe. She talked about it as really being like, I need you all to tell me what I am doing wrong, how it could be better, and kind of taking some of that focus that had only been on black boys and thinking about, okay, not how do we shift it or switch it, but expand it, right? So the specific needs and brilliances and insights of black girls can directly influence her as a school leader, right? And so I think that's some of the kind of stuff that folks there did to shift that uh, deficit orientation as the primary code of black girlhood, right? And it's important to note that it wasn't done just by a black person, right? It was done by a non-black person of color in specific um, orientation towards and respect of and honoring of black experience. Any other questions? Well, we walk through and look at everybody in the eye. <laughs> I want to know if Soul has a question. You kind of had one earlier. Your soul has a question. <laughs> Oh, okay, 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 okay. We got a question right here, and then we also um, we could take this last question, and then we're going to be giving away some books, and there'll be a quick book signing. Oh wow! Yeah. So book prize for people who stay there, yes. <laughs> stay there, and you get a book prize. Yeah. As people leave, I'm like, yes, more books. Still here. <laughs> Better chances for everyone else. Okay, uh, go ahead. Um, so, how do you believe? Uh, low income levels for black girls are much greater. Mm -hmm. All American African American students in general. Um, how does that low income affect their uh, their disciplinary action inflicted upon them by the school and by police? Okay, so you're thinking they're trying to be like, well, there's a few things. I think um, while black women are paid less, like uh, proportionally than black men are, they're actually significantly more educated. 
than black men. Actually, black women are the most likely person in the US to complete a degree, right, proportionally for their group. And so I think in some ways there's a mischaracterization, uh, similar to what we see from Kate, the mischaracterization of black girls as somehow the, you know, the least, making the least money or having the least progress when they're actually the most likely not only to have completed a degree, but black women are also the most likely to have read a book this year, right? So we vote more than other people. We read more than other people. We go to school more than other people, right? And so even with that material context, there is a perception that we are um, somehow lagging behind. So I think part of it is we need to address the perception because the work is happening, right? You know, black girls are out here engaging the system as it is with the tools that are available and yet still not getting that far. So I think that that's one part of it. Um, in terms of the policing, that's a really good point that you brought up. Um, black women are uh, incarcerated at a far lower rate than black men, of course, and are the rate of them going into prison is increasing faster than any other group of women, right? Native women, of course, are also significantly over-incarcerated right? But the rate of Black women going into prison is rising over time. And I think that the, the reasons for that are actually really linked to what we see in the school system. The part of the thing, the more that you go to school, the more that you interface with that school system as a site of vulnerability, right? So if you look at Monique Morris's work, um, she really does a great job of showing the interconnections between school push out and criminal justice involvement, right? So often when you get that willful defiance call at Robeson, they didn't call the police for that kind of stuff. But down the hill at a different school, they would, right? And so I think it's also seeing that those, um, sometimes it's interconnected at the institutional level, right? Where school police officers will be called in to break up a fight, right? Or to address someone for being truant, right? And so I think that's where you see some of those connections happening. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So please join me in thanking Dr. Thank you so much. In the taller with your Figueroa. Thank you so much for this. You, I hope you all know, this is a shining star in the constellation of Black Studies. Look, you heard it here now. We got a few more events. So next month, we're going to be um, hosting Vandy Gil Sadler for Woo! the Taller. She's amazing. And she'll be talking about conjuring cartography, Black placemaking in the Cold War, and Gloria Nailis Mama Day. In March, we're going to be hosting um, Jarvis McGinnis for the Taller, Blackness, the Sacred, and the phonographic archive of the diaspora. That's right. And in April, the taller is going to be run by Jose Arturo Ballester, who is a photographer and an <gasps> artist, and he's been here for three weeks <gasps> working with students. So what? you produce your work alongside the photographer, and we will be um, displaying at the MSG Museum. So yes. uh, let me know if you have any other questions, and then you can look at this poster for more information, okay? Thank you, and thank you to Jessica Marie Johnson and everybody from Hopkins. Thank so you. On this Facebook Live, we love y'all. All of this will be posted on the website. The full talk is being recorded. Right. And the podcast that we recorded this morning will also be on the website, electricbarnard.com. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And then, Tamara, do you want to run the raffle? Woo! The raffle. Woo! The raffle. Yeah. <laughs> the raffle. I just want to thank Jessica Figueroa for it. Well, the raffle being yeah. recorded. The raffle. The raffle. The raffle. <laughs> you have to come up here and say hi on the Facebook Live. Hey, <laughs> The win is Leonora Okay, where's Leonora? Oh. Okay, Leonora Leonora. I thought you said Nena. Leonora. Leonora. Okay, that's why I want to hold everything. I said Nena. I said, okay, Nena. Not Nena, like that Nena. The twins. <laughs> Next person, Chris Long. Oh, he's gone. Not Long. Not <laughs> Anthony Barash. That's you. Yeah. Woo! Anthony, Anthony. <laughs> Did a book and you got to pull a name, so you know. Keep it going. <laughs>